Book One, Part Three of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One. Part Three, Paragraphs thirty seven to sixty two. This was his answer, and the Mysians were satisfied with it. But the son of Croesus now entered, having heard what the Mysians had asked for, and when Croesus refused to send his son with them, the young man said, Father, it was once thought very fine and noble for us to go to war and the chase and win renown, but now you have barred me from both of these, although you have seen neither cowardice nor lack of spirit in me. With what face can I now show myself whenever I go to and from the marketplace? What will the men of the city think of me, and what my newly wedded wife? With what kind of man will she think that she lives? So either let me go to the hunt, or show me by reasoning that what you are doing is best for me. My son, answered Croesus, I do this not because I have seen cowardice or anything unseemly in you, but the vision of a dream stood over me in my sleep, and told me that you would be short-lived, for you would be killed by a spear of iron. It is because of that vision that I hurried your marriage, and do not send you on any enterprise that I have in hand, but keep guard over you, so that perhaps I may rob death of you during my lifetime. You are my only son. For that other, since he is ruined, he doesn't exist for me. Father, the youth replied, no one can blame you for keeping guard over me when you have seen such a vision, but it is my right to show you what you do not perceive and why you mistake the meaning of the dream. You say that the dream told you that I should be killed by a spear of iron, but has a boar hands? Has it that iron spear which you dread? Had the dream said I should be killed by a tusk or some other thing proper to a boar, you would be right in acting as you act. But no, it was to be by a spear. Therefore, since it is not against men that we are to fight, let me go. Croesus answered, My son, your judgment concerning the dream has somewhat reassured me, and being reassured by you, I change my thinking and permit you to go to the chase. Having said this, Croesus sent for Adrastus the Phrygian, and when he came, addressed him thus. Adrastus, when you were struck by ugly misfortune, for which I do not blame you, it was I who cleansed you, and received, and still keep you in my house, defraying all your keep. Now then, as you owe me a return of good service for the good which I have done you, I ask that you watch over my son as he goes out to the chase. See that no thieving criminals meet you on the way to do you harm. Besides, it is only right that you too should go where you can win renown by your deeds. That is fitting for your father's son, and you are strong enough besides. O king, Adrastus answered, I would not otherwise have gone into such an arena. One so unfortunate as I should not associate with the prosperous among his peers, nor have I the wish so to do, and for many reasons I would have held back. But now, since you urge it, and I must please you, since I owe you a return of good service, I am ready to do this. And as for your son, in so far as I can protect him, look for him to come back unharmed. So when Adrastus had answered Croesus thus, they went out, provided with chosen young men and dogs. When they came to Mount Olympus, they hunted for the beast, 
and, finding him, formed a circle and threw their spears at him. Then the guest called Adrastus, the man who had been cleansed of the deed of blood, missed the boar with his spear and hit the son of Croesus. So Attis was struck by the spear and fulfilled the prophecy of the dream. One ran to tell Croesus what had happened, and coming to Sardis told the king of the fight and the fate of his son. Distraught by the death of his son, Croesus cried out the more vehemently because the killer was one whom he himself had cleansed of blood, and in his great and terrible grief at this mischance, he called on Zeus by three names, Zeus the Purifier, Zeus of the Hearth, Zeus of Comrades, the first because he wanted the god to know what evil his guest had done him, the second because he had received the guest into his house and thus unwittingly entertained the murderer of his son, and the third because he had found his worst enemy in the man whom he had sent as a protector. Soon the Lydians came, bearing the corpse, with the murderer following after. He then came and stood before the body, and gave himself up to Croesus, holding out his hands, and telling him to kill him over the corpse, mentioning his former misfortune, and that on top of that he had destroyed the one who purified him, and that he was not fit to live. On hearing this, Croesus took pity on Adrastus, though his own sorrow was so great, and said to him, Friend, I have from you the entire penalty, since you sentence yourself to death. But it is not you that I hold the cause of this evil, except in so far as you were the unwilling doer of it, but one of the gods, the same one who told me long ago what was to be. So Croesus buried his own son in such manner as was fitting. But Adrastus, son of Gordias, who was son of Midas, this Adrastus, the destroyer of his own brother and of the man who purified him, when the tomb was undisturbed by the presence of men, killed himself there by the sepulchre, seeing clearly now that he was the most heavily afflicted of all whom he knew. After the loss of his son, Croesus remained in deep sorrow for two years. After this time, the destruction by Cyrus, son of Cambyses, of the sovereignty of Astyages, son of Cyaraxes, and the growth of the power of the Persians, distracted Croesus from his mourning, and he determined, if he could, to forestall the increase of the Persian power before they became great. Having thus determined, he at once made inquiries of the Greek and Libyan oracles, sending messengers separately to Delphi, to Abbey in Phocia, and to Dodona, while others were dispatched to Amphiarius and Strophonius, and others to Branchidae in the Milesian country. These are the Greek oracles to which Croesus sent for divination, and he told others to go inquire of Ammon in Libya. His intent in sending was to test the knowledge of the oracles, so that if they were found to know the truth, he might send again and ask if he should undertake an expedition against the Persians. And when he sent to test these shrines, he gave the Lydians these instructions. They were to keep track of the time from the day they left Sardis, and on the hundredth day inquire of the oracles what Croesus, king of Lydia, son of Aleates, was doing then. Then they were to write down whatever the oracles answered, and bring the reports back to him. Now none relate what answer was given by the rest of the oracles. But at Delphi, no sooner had the Lydians entered the hall to inquire of the god, and asked the question with which they were entrusted, than the Pythian priestess uttered the following hexameter verses. I know the number of the grains of sand and the extent of the sea, and understand the mute and hear the voiceless. 
the smell has come to my senses of a strong-shelled tortoise boiling in a cauldron together with a lamb's flesh, under which is bronze and over which is bronze. Having written down this inspired utterance of the Pythian priestess, the Lydians went back to Sardis. When the others as well, who had been sent to various places, came bringing their oracles, Croesus then unfolded and examined all the writings. Some of them in no way satisfied him, but when he read the Delphian message, he acknowledged it with worship and welcome, considering Delphi as the only true place of divination, because it had discovered what he himself had done. For after sending his envoys to the oracles, he had thought up something which no conjecture could discover, and carried it out on the appointed day. Namely, he had cut up a tortoise and a lamb, and then boiled them in a cauldron of bronze covered with a lid of the same. Such, then, was the answer from Delphi delivered to Croesus. As to the reply which the Lydians received from the oracle of Amphiarius, when they had followed the due custom of the temple, I cannot say what it was, for nothing is recorded of it, except that Croesus believed that from this oracle too he had obtained a true answer. After this he tried to win the favour of the Delphian god with great sacrifices. He offered up three thousand beasts from all the kinds fit for sacrifice, and on a great pyre burnt couches covered with gold and silver, golden goblets, and purple cloaks and tunics. By these means he hoped the better to win the aid of the god, to whom he also commanded that every Lydian sacrifice what he could. When the sacrifice was over, he melted down a vast store of gold, and made ingots of it, the longer sides of which were of six, and the shorter of three palms' length, and the height was one palm. There were a hundred and seventeen of these. Four of them were of refined gold, each weighing two talents and a half. The rest were of gold with silver alloy, each of two talents' weight. He also had a figure of a lion made of refined gold, weighing ten talents. When the temple of Delphi was burnt, this lion fell from the ingots which were the base on which it stood, and now it is in the treasury of the Corinthians, but weighs only six talents and a half, for the fire melted away three and a half talents. When these offerings were ready, Croesus sent them to Delphi, with other gifts besides, namely two very large bowls, one of gold and one of silver. The golden bowl stood to the right, the silver to the left of the temple entrance. These two were removed about the time of the temple's burning, and now the golden bowl, which weighs eight and a half talents and twelve minae, is in the treasury of the Cladzominians, and the silver bowl at the corner of the forecourt of the temple. This bowl holds six hundred nine-gallon measures, for the Delphians use it for a mixing bowl at the feast of the divine appearance. It is said by the Delphians to be the work of Theodorus of Samos, and I agree with them, for it seems to me to be of no common workmanship. Moreover, Croesus sent four silver casks, which stand in the treasury of the Corinthians, and dedicated two sprinkling vessels, one of gold, one of silver. The golden vessel bears the inscription given by the Lacedaemonians, who claim it as their offering. But they are wrong, for this too is Croesus' gift. The inscription was made by a certain Delphian, whose name I know but do not mention, out of his desire to please the Lacedaemonians. The figure of a boy through whose hand the water runs is indeed a Lacedaemonian gift, but they did not give either of the sprinkling vessels. Along with these Croesus sent, besides many other offerings of no great distinction, certain round basins of silver, and a female figure five feet high, which the Delphians assert to be the statue of the woman who was Croesus' baker. 
Moreover, he dedicated his own wife's necklaces and girdles. Such were the gifts which he sent to Delphi. To Amphiarius, of whose courage and fate he had heard, he dedicated a shield made entirely of gold, and a spear all of solid gold, point and shaft alike. Both of these were, until my time, at Thebes, in the Theban temple of Ismenian Apollo. The Lydians who were to bring these gifts to the temples were instructed by Croesus to inquire of the oracles whether he was to send an army against the Persians, and whether he was to add an army of allies. When the Lydians came to the places where they were sent, they presented the offerings and inquired of the oracles in these words. Croesus, king of Lydia and other nations, believing that here are the only true places of divination among men, endows you with such gifts as your wisdom deserves. And now he asks you whether he is to send an army against the Persians, and whether he is to add an army of allies. Such was their inquiry, and the judgment given to Croesus by each of the two oracles was the same, namely that if he should send an army against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. And they advised him to discover the mightiest of the Greeks, and make them his friends. When the divine answers had been brought back, and Croesus learned of them, he was very pleased with the oracles. So, altogether expecting that he would destroy the kingdom of Cyrus, he sent once again to Pytho and endowed the Delphians, whose number he had learned, with two gold staters apiece. The Delphians, in return, gave Croesus and all Lydians the right of first consulting the oracle, exemption from all charges, the chief seats at festivals, and perpetual right of Delphian citizenship to whoever should wish it. After his gifts to the Delphians, Croesus made a third inquiry of the oracle, for he wanted to use it to the full, having received true answers from it, and the question which he asked was whether his sovereignty would be of long duration. To this the Pythian priestess answered as follows, when the Medes have a mule as king, just then, tender-footed Lydian, by the stone-strewn Hermus, flee and do not stay, and do not be ashamed to be a coward. When he heard these verses, Croesus was pleased with them above all, for he thought that a mule would never be king of the Medes instead of a man, and therefore that he and his posterity would never lose his empire. Then he sought very carefully to discover who the mightiest of the Greeks were, whom he should make his friends. He found by inquiry that the chief peoples were the Lacedaemonians among those of Doric, and the Athenians among those of Ionic stock. These races, Ionian and Dorian, were the foremost in ancient time, the first a Pelasgian and the second a Hellenic people. The Pelasgian race has never yet left its home. The Hellenic has wandered often and far. For in the days of King Deucalion it inhabited the land of Thea. Then the country called Histiaean under Ossa and Olympus in the time of Dorus son of Helene. Driven from this Histiaean country by the Cadmians, it settled about Pindus in the territory called Macedonian. From there again it migrated to Dryopia, and at last came from Dryopia into the Peloponnese, where it took the name of Dorian. What language the Pelasgian spoke I cannot say definitely, but if one may judge by those that still remain of the Pelasgians who live above the Tyrrhenae in the city of Crestone, who were once neighbours of the people now called Dorians, and at that time inhabited the country which now is called Thessalian, and of the Pelasgians who inhabited Placia and Silesi on the Hellespont, who came to live among the Athenians, and by other towns too which were once Pelasgian and afterwards took a different name, if, as I said, one may judge by these, the Pelasgians spoke a language which was not Greek. 
if then all the pelasgian stock spoke so then the attic nation being of pelasgian blood must have changed its language too at the time when it became part of the hellenes for the people of creston and placia have a language of their own in common which is not the language of their neighbours and it is plain that they still preserve the manner of speech which they brought with them in their migration into the places where they live but the hellenic stock it seems clear to me has always had the same language since its beginning yet being when separated from the pelasgians few in number they have grown from a small beginning to comprise a multitude of nations chiefly because the pelasgians and many other foreign peoples united themselves with them before that i think the pelasgic stock nowhere increased much in number while it was of foreign speech now of these two peoples croesus learned that the attic was held in subjection and divided into factions by pisistratus son of hippocrates who at that time was sovereign over the athenians this hippocrates was still a private man when a great marvel happened to him when he was at olympia to see the games when he had offered the sacrifice the vessels standing there full of meat and water boiled without fire until they boiled over chilon the lacedaemonian who happened to be there and who saw this marvel advised hippocrates not to take to his house a wife who could bear children but if he had one already then to send her away and if he had a son to disown him hippocrates refused to follow the advice of chilon and afterward there was born to him this pisistratus who when there was a feud between the athenians of the coast under megacles son of alcmeon and the athenians of the plain under lycurgus son of aristoleides raised up a third faction as he coveted the sovereign power he collected partisans and pretended to champion the uplanders and the following was his plan wounding himself and his mules he drove his wagon into the market-place with a story that he had escaped from his enemies who would have killed him so he said as he was driving into the country so he implored the people to give him a guard and indeed he had won a reputation in his command of the army against the megarians when he had taken nicaea and performed other great exploits taken in the athenian people gave him a guard of chosen citizens whom pisistratus made clubmen instead of spearmen for the retinue that followed him carried wooden clubs these rose with pisistratus and took the acropolis and pisistratus ruled the athenians disturbing in no way the order of offices nor changing the laws but governing the city according to its established constitution and arranging all things fairly and well but after a short time the partisans of megacles and of lycurgus made common cause and drove him out in this way pisistratus first got athens and as he had a sovereignty that was not yet firmly rooted lost it presently his enemies who together had driven him out began to feud once more then megacles harassed by factional strife sent a message to pisistratus offering him his daughter to marry and the sovereign power besides when this offer was accepted by pisistratus who agreed on these terms with megacles they devised a plan to bring pisistratus back which to my mind was so exceptionally foolish that it is strange since from old times the hellenic stock has always been distinguished from foreign by its greater cleverness and its freedom from silly foolishness that these men should devise such a plan to deceive athenians said to be the subtlest of the greeks there was in the paeanian deme a woman called phaia three fingers short of six feet four inches in height and otherwise too well formed 
This woman they equipped in full armour and put in a chariot, giving her all the paraphernalia to make the most impressive spectacle, and so drove into the city. Heralds ran before them, and when they came into town proclaimed as they were instructed, Athenians, give a hearty welcome to Pisistratus, whom Athena herself honours above all men, and is bringing back to her own Acropolis. So the heralds went about proclaiming this, and immediately the report spread in the deems that Athena was bringing Pisistratus back, and the townsfolk, believing that the woman was the goddess herself, worshipped this human creature, and welcomed Pisistratus. Having got back his sovereignty in the manner which I have described, Pisistratus married Megacles' daughter according to his agreement with Megacles. But as he already had young sons, and as the Alcmeonid family was said to be under a curse, he had no wish that his newly wedded wife bear him children, and therefore had unusual intercourse with her. At first the woman hid the fact. Presently she told her mother, whether interrogated or not I do not know, and the mother told her husband. Megacles was very angry to be dishonoured by Pisistratus, and in his anger he patched up his quarrel with the other faction. Pisistratus, learning what was going on, went alone away from the country altogether, and came to Eretria, where he deliberated with his sons. The opinion of Hippias prevailing that they should recover the sovereignty, they set out collecting contributions from all the cities that owed them anything. Many of these gave great amounts, the Thebans more than any, and in course of time, not to make a long story, everything was ready for their return, for they brought Argive mercenaries from the Peloponnese, and there joined them on his own initiative a man of Naxos called Ligdemis, who was most keen in their cause, and brought them money and men. So after ten years they set out from Eretria and returned home. The first place in Attica which they took and held was Marathon, and while encamped there they were joined by their partisans from the city, and by others who flocked to them from the country, deemsmen who loved the rule of one more than freedom. These then assembled, but the Athenians in the city, who, while Pisistratus was collecting money, and afterwards, when he had taken Marathon, took no notice of it, did now, and when they learned that he was marching from Marathon against Athens, they set out to attack him. They came out with all their force to meet the returning exiles. Pisistratus' men encountered the enemy when they had reached the temple of Pelenian Athena in their march from Marathon towards the city, and encamped face to face with them. There, by the providence of heaven, Pisistratus met Amphilitus the Acarnanian, a diviner, who came to him and prophesied as follows in hexameter verses, The cast is made, the net spread. The tunny fish shall flash in the moonlit night. End of Book One, Part Three. Recording by Graham Redmond.